All right. Well, that was embarrassing. My uh, machine decided to blue screen on me in the middle of the stream. So you get your service provider handoff, and it's typically going to be single mode. Um, it'll typically be a 1310 nanometer. Um, it definitely ask that information. You should always ask that information of your service provider, um, regardless of you know who it is and what you're trying to do, so that you make sure that you've got the right optics. Um, ask them what that handoff is going to be, what the signaling is. Is it going to be single mode 1310? Is it going to be single mode 1550? Um, they will happily share that information with you because they want to make sure that they've got the right connection and you've got the right connection so that they can get it all turned up and everything's up and running. So there you go. Service provider handoffs, 1310 nanometer. 1550 is what they will use if they're going to run for an extremely long distance. Um, maybe this internet service provider's uh, network interface device is, you know, quite a distance away. And they're going to be using um, those doped fiber amplifiers along the path. Um, maybe, maybe you're like, you know, in Texas and um, you're out in one of the further out cities uh, while they've got all of their big network devices consolidated in like Dallas. Um, they would run erbium dope fiber amps in smaller um, intermediary facilities between the two cities, between you and the internet service providers, a you know, consolidated network infrastructure. And they'll use 1510 nanometer optics for that. Um, so you'll have to make sure that you've got the right optic to match. So distance. So the distance is typically measured by attenuation. Um, I, I, my, I believe that the uh, sweet spot for attenuation is 23 dB. Um, so let's see, this is uh, 1550 nanometer uh, fiber optic uh, distance uh, attenuation. So I think it's probably going to be about that that 23 dB. Um, but it's it's that right sweet spot where the signal and the noise have been brought down to a point where when you amplify it, the noise stays low enough and you're not bringing all of that noise up. But if you get too much further, your signal and the noise are going to start becoming too close. And when you amplify, you're going to be bringing up a lot of noise as well. So I think it was 23 dB was that sweet spot distance. Um, and... That this starts getting into a different type of technology, which is called DWDM, or Dense Wave Division Multiplexing. But that gets into a lot more of the service, provi service provider type of fiber optic uh, signaling. And the whole network becomes more complicated. But for me and Jared and our company, we're not going to be d doing DWDM yet. Um, we're, we're too... We're too small for that yet. So, I, I know as the CEO, he has big aspirations and goals, but as the CTO, I gotta keep all that kind of contained against the gotta still has to make sense. So, we've built our network and we've got two offices one on the East Coast and one on the West Coast. And we've got our finance people and we've got our engineers, and we're building out a bigger infrastructure. So, we're gonna grow some more. Um, so Jared, how are we going to grow the company? We've got more people and we need to get more people online in our company. So what are we going to do next? Um, we so could should we, should we potentially we expand have, uh, some cloud? people um, work from home? There you go. There you go. That's a good idea. Work from home. So now we can start talking about the bigger infrastructures and the bigger architectures um, we're not going to go into the zero trust architecture because we're going to keep it a little bit more simplistic. Uh, while zero trust architecture, zero trust architectures are where the industry tends to be leaning toward. The concept of a zero trust infrastructure is relatively straightforward. It's not it, the the ideas behind it are they make sense. But the infrastructure to implement isn't always so straightforward. It also depends on how you define what zero trust is, right? 
the concept of I don't trust you until I trust you is the basis of the zero trust infrastructure. So if you have somebody, so here's here's Donnie. He's he's our new our new IT guy out in the field. So we've got Donnie. He's working from home, and Donnie needs to connect to the network. So how is he going to connect? And then how do we know that Donnie is Donnie? So the idea of we don't trust Donnie until Donnie proves that he's trustworthy. So he's going to connect to our firewall. And we're going to go and we're not going to adopt too much of the zero trust infrastructure yet. So we're going to say he's going to connect via IPsec because we've already covered that in one of our videos, IPsec. IPsec is well known, understood, and it's relatively secure. If you go IPv2, it's a good secure protocol. And we're gonna use certificates, so we're gonna be introducing something called PKI, the public key infrastructure. The concepts operate on the uh, asynchronous keys of uh, RSA, so you've got an RSA public key, you've got an RSA private key, you've got certificates, so you've got what uh, is considered a root of trust. So you've got what they call a certificate authority, and that is your root of trust. What is a root of trust? A root of trust is where a chain of trust begins. You say, I trust this thing. I trust the certificate authority, and I trust the things that the certificate authority says are trustworthy. So your zero trust infrastructure still has to have a root of trust. You have to have a thing that you trust. That makes sense, right? And it, it's, it's, it's a, a, a pretty basic concept right if you've got Donnie and Donnie does work and Donnie applies to have a job and we've got Jared and Jared says I like Donnie I trust Jared Jared trusts Donnie I like Donnie so we've got kind of a transitive trust here right but the root trust is from Jared so as long as I trust Jared and Jared trusts Donnie then I should be able to trust Donnie too right does that make sense? Makes sense. Makes sense. So, a root of trust. A root of trust. And it kind of goes along a few other concepts and other things that, you know, as a, a IT engineer, you should be tracking. So, you've got root of trust. And you've got other things. You've got, like, a, soul, uh, a single source of truth. Single source of truth. And this is a thing that I, I, I kind of live and breathe by. Uh, it's it's very important to me. It's it, it simplifies so many things if people just consider it. Single source of truth. The concept is simple. If you have a thing that says a thing, then you should have everybody referencing that thing, right? If you've got a book and that book has all of the wonderful things in life written down in it, and it keeps adding more because you know my my sage wisdom as i'm you know traversing through life and i'm writing new things in there i'm like you know you know don't lick toilet seats and i write that in the book and jared's like i want to know great things and i'm gonna go and i'm gonna look at this book of wisdom that jeremy has bestowed upon me and i flip to the page and it says don't lick toilet seats and i'm like you know that makes sense but i want to make sure that that message isn't lost I want to make sure that that message is conveyed clearly so that everybody knows that message. So instead of Jared playing the telephone game and telling everybody that he knows don't lick toilet seats, which becomes don't lick doorknobs, which be, you know becomes don't lick everything, um, Jared tells people to come and check out my book of wisdom. My book of wisdom, my single source of truth, then everybody can come and see don't lick toilet seats and that doesn't you know end up becoming you know don't lick you know your your your, your favorite ice cream but making sure that the truth doesn't change 
that the truth is always there for everybody to access, and it's always the same truth. So when Jared says, go reference the great book of truth on not licking toilet seats, then everybody makes sure that they see the same message. That's the single source of truth. The moment Jared takes that truth and conveys it to someone else, he becomes a new source of truth. By him becoming another source of truth, we no longer have a single source of truth. So the message can either become mutated or it can become, um, uh, like it can fail to be converged with the rest of the truth. So if, you know, my, my truth changes from don't lick toilet seats to don't lick public toilet seats. Private toilet seats are fine. You can lick the toilet seat in your house, but just don't lick the one at the airport. That, it, that message is different now. If Jared is a source of truth for don't lick toilet seats, he did not get the update of uh, you can lick some toilet seats, but not the airport toilet seat. So that truth needs to come from a single place. Everybody's looking at the same thing. So that was my that was my soapbox on single source of truth. So hopefully that, that made sense. sense. So the, the real takeaway is don't lick toilet seats. Um, and I'll, it also goes back to you know the same things that you're going to have in every IT shop is um, the all of the spreadsheets. Everybody makes a new spreadsheet and they email the spreadsheet and then you have 18 spreadsheets and then each of them is different. And then what do you do? So now you've got 18 spreadsheets. You've got 15 different engineers that are all assigning the exact same IP address. And now you've just got a mess. So a single source of truth. This concept evolved as, you know, IT infrastructure and all kinds of other things evolved and you started recognizing that the moment you copy data from database A to database B, database B is no longer synchronized with database A. Um, in the IT field, um, something like that would be called an IPAM, an IP address manager, or maybe a configuration management tool. These tools are the um, irrefutable source of truth. So your IP address manager is always the one thing that says the IP addresses are this. And in any dispute, you always reference the IPAM. In a configuration management um, tool, if the network device you have decides to brain itself and forget how to do what it does, you go back to the configuration management tool and you grab the config from there and you say, this is the best config we have and I pulled it from this source because I know that that's the one that's kept up to date regularly th through tools like Rancid or something like that and I'm gonna put the config back onto the device. So your single source of truth. Um, and it's similar to your root of truth, your certificate authority and other things. Um, you establish the one thing that you trust above all else and you protect it, you shelter it, and you make sure that it's safe. So this is where you start getting into um, other bigger concepts, but your certificate authority. So you created a certificate authority and the certificate authority creates what are called subordinate certificate authorities. So remember when I said chain of trust? So it's your subordinate certificate authority. So now you have two different certificate authorities. You have what's called the root certificate authority and then you have a subordinate certificate authority. So you've got your root CA and your sub CA. And your sub CA will issue your certificates. So in this scenario, you're going to have what would be called a user certificate. There you go. So we've got this and we've got that. All right, so we've got a root certificate authority, we've got a subordinate certificate authority, and we've got a user certificate authority, uh, user certificate. And all of these use the public key infrastructure, the RSA keys. So the root certificate authority signs their certificate with some hashes, and then you have a subordinate certificate authority. So the subordinate certificate authority creates a certificate, hashes it, and then signs it with its key. So now you've got all of these. Um, within the user certificate, there will also be 
the public key uh, embedded within it so that it knows how to properly talk uh, with the uh, with the owner of the certificate so we have Donnie Donnie's got his user certificate and he's going to use it for his uh, VPN session so his user certificate is used and exchanged via Ike to the firewall and he has an IP6 VPN session so that was a really long explanation on uh, certificate security, certificate-based security and public key infrastructure. So why did we go into that? We went into that because public key infrastructure has a few very good critical functions. And one of those is um, immutable uh, issuance of uh, identification, as well as a way of identifying the cryptography methods and validating that the certificates haven't been tampered so that uh, root of trust is known and um, hasn't been forged you haven't introduced anything that can um, uh, put the root of trust and this chain of trust into um, question so the user certificate is used with the IPsec session. The firewall has its own certificate. The two of them exchange, and as long as they both trust the root CA, then the two of them will be able to engage in a conversation because they trust each other's certificates. Usually what you'll have with a VPN architecture is a, a, like a trusted user list and maybe you have a list of users that are trusted or maybe you have like you know something within the certificate some special field or some special data element in the certificate that you're going to say these are acceptable user certificates and then you begin your session so we've got Donnie out in the field and he's getting connected into our network network infrastructure so right now he's coming in with IPsec into the firewall and he shows up onto the network and he can access all of the resources so Donnie's able to communicate and that works, right? Works good for me. I love scotch, 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 scotch. <laughs> Woo. That's a good one. All right. So Donnie comes into the network and he accesses the network. And this architecture works great right up until it doesn't because today this firewall died. So now we have to figure out what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Donnie can't get on the network. Donnie's calling. He's upset. You've got the people in finance and the IT engineers here at this site on the West Coast. And they're all upset because they can't access the network. Let's see. Can I change the color? Can I go boom. All right, there we go, because red is bad, right? And green is good. All right, so our West Coast site, it just went down. And for whatever reason, all things are bad. So Donnie is stuck. So what do we do now? Our next option is probably something like um, redundant connections. Maybe we've got two different VPN services we're going to establish. Uh, maybe we've got... Uh, way to select which site so maybe Donnie has a drop-down menu or a way to choose you know is he gonna connect to East Coast or West Coast um, let's see what other what other, what other options would we have so we start talking about redundancy right um, and we start talking about single points of failure sorry I've got uh, I'm struggling with allergies here so I'm getting all uh, congested now the, the, the day is getting late my meds aren't uh, working out so well so Donnie is connected and let's say technically he's up here right he's he's connecting via the internet so we're gonna we're gonna change his connection here because we want to make sure that we're we're properly illustrating this so we're gonna change our connector type to this wiggly jobber and we're gonna go we're gonna go through the internet so we're gonna go there we go. 
All right, so Donnie's connecting through the internet, right? He's on his home connection. And uh, uh, let's see, let's say he's on Verizon Fios, right? So he's on Fios. I don't promote Fios, but Fios is good. So whatever you've got in your area. So what other, what other kind of redundancy options would we have here, right? Because Donnie's important. We want to make sure that Donnie is as, is as productive as possible. So we're like, Donnie, what, what can we do to keep you connected? Maybe your Fios connection isn't so good. You know, maybe he doesn't have Fios. Maybe he's got Comcast. And maybe Comcast in his area isn't so awesome. So we could be like, Donnie, why don't you go get Fios? Or maybe check out Google Fiber or, or Jaguar or... Uh, it's not CenturyLink anymore. It's Lumen. Maybe, maybe you've got something like that. And Donnie's like, no, all I've got is Comcast in my neighborhood. And... We have to figure out another option for Donnie. So what can we do for Donnie? One thing we can do is we can introduce more tech because what solves the problem better than more tech. So let's give Donnie more tech. So we're gonna start looking at other things. So what would be a connectivity option that we could use to give him redundancy? We could do wireless 5G. Everybody wants 5G, right? Uh, we don't want satellite. We don't want satellite. We'll do this. Here we go. Here's a nice little jobber here. That's a big antenna. Let's make this smaller. 5G. We've got 5G. We got all the G's. So we've got 5G. 5G. 5G wireless. Cellular. So we got Donnie up on some cellular. So now he's got redundancy. So when Comcast, you know, goes bad because maybe maybe he has a storm. So Donnie's Donnie's stuck in a storm. And his Comcast is down, but his cellular is still operating because uh, cellular infrastructure is is recognized uh, critical infrastructure uh, by the FCC, so they have to have all kinds of good backups and other things. So his 5G is still working. So Donnie's got his 5G. How's that sound, Jared? As the CEO, what do you think? Do you think 5G is good for Donnie? I think so. Is that an expense that we want to Should... pick up as the company, or is he on his own? No, you know, I think if we if we want Donnie to work, uh, if his internet goes down, then that's at our expense. Yeah, I agree. I agree. But, you know, I'm the CTO, right? So I think that, you know, Donnie's got something valuable to contribute, and I can solve it with, tech, uh, with a tech solution. So it's better than saying, Donnie, you know... You couldn't connect because Comcast, you know, isn't so awesome in your area, and we're just not going to pay you. So I'm pretty sure Donnie's not going to be happy about that, right? No, he's probably not. Donnie's gonna probably going to be looking for long. something else. Yep, yep, yep. He probably would be. He'd be like, no, no, I'll go somewhere where my my talents are valued. All right, so we solved the single point of failure of Donnie's Comcast by adding 5G, but we don't have the world's greatest solution for his, for the scenario where you know our west coast office isn't operating properly so now we start talking about adding redundant connectivity paths so we're going to say do, do 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 so we've got a dotted line dotted lines are optional we're going to say that you know Donnie can choose to use the east coast facility to connect into the network because we want to give Donnie options. So Donnie now has multiple paths, right? This is good stuff. All right, let's finish drawing all of our lines. So we've got to get all of our lines right because otherwise I'm going to start getting twitchy over here and I don't want to be twitchy. All right, so Donnie's got his his lines that I'm not happy with. 
All right, we'll just have to settle with that. I'll just stop looking at it so much. So Donnie's got a secondary pass, so he can pop into the East Coast office and he can get back to work. Um, all of our people in the West Coast, you know, facility in the office aren't 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 doing so hot. They're they're very displeased. Um, the firewall is down. Their connectivity is out, and they're kind of stuck. So, what's the what's the next thing we do? You know, what can we do? Uh, we what can we do about this office? We build redundancy in our uh, West Coast office, right? Yep. Yep. We could do that. So what kind of redundancy would we, we, would we be looking at? What, what kind of what kind of faults are we trying to avoid or what kind of faults are we trying to protect ourselves against? Are we looking at are we looking at single device hardware failure? Yes. Yeah. OK. I would probably say um, a dual WAN. There you go. All right, so those are both good options. So we're going to look at, you know, two devices, and we're going to look at a dual WAN architecture. So we're we're gonna we're gonna take our West Coast office and we're gonna spread it out a little bit more because you know maybe it's maybe it's in California and they're struggling with uh, wildfires right now. So um, in our office, we're we're a little bit too close to the to the hot zone, and we're finding that it's impacting you know, our, our availability of internet service. So we're going to go and we're going to do a couple of options. So we've got one internet connection and we're going to have a second internet connection. All right. So we've got this and we need you to go here. I need to change my line type to this. Burr, burr. Change it from a dotted to a dashed. Boom. All right. So we've got our two firewalls. And our two firewalls now are in our West Coast office are going to start serving our, our facility here. So how are we going to do this now? So we've got two routers. Are we going to have two separate, two separate WAN addresses? Probably, right? Because we're going to have two different internet service yep. providers, right? So let's say this is going to be um, Verizon Business. So we've got Verizon Business over here on this WAN connection. And we've got... Let's put you here. And we've got Lumen over here. Lumen. All right, so we've got Lumen and we've got Verizon Business. All right, so we've got our connectivities. So we've got two different internet connections from two different service providers because we're going for diversity. We want we want to have different connections. So now, what does that mean for Donnie? That means he has now three internet connect or three different VPN selections, doesn't he? So this this whole thing starts getting bigger and bigger, right? The complexity starts growing and growing. Um, you start getting a bigger and bigger problem and it's difficult to determine what the right solution is from here it's it, it's a it's a complicated problem do you add four or five six seven eight different vpn profiles so now donnie has to know which one he wants to connect to maybe maybe our lumen service is a lower bandwidth than our verizon business because it's a better cost you know option in this particular area verizon is slightly cheaper than lumen and we chose to get a bigger connection on verizon service and a smaller secondary connection on lumen so now what does donnie need to know the difference between the verizon and the lumen do we identify one as primary and one as secondary and then what is the east coast is that tertiary so that the whole thing starts getting a little bit, a little bit more confusing, um, and it becomes more of a frustration for the users because they need to know what they're connecting to, and it's just not something that they should know. It's not something that should they should need to know. So what what's our what's our new option? So so Jared, you came to me and you said, you know, 
Donnie and our other remote users are getting frustrated. They don't know how to connect to the network anymore. It's getting too complicated. Things are getting too big and the users don't know how to use the system. Right? It makes sense, right? Yes. It gets it gets too confusing and people start losing interest in cooperating and users get upset. And you don't want upset users. All right. So Jared came to me with a new problem. He's like, we need to simplify our remote access connectivity options. So now, now I'm sitting here and I'm looking at the network with, with Jared and I'm saying, you know, what do we do? I need to take a step back and we need to look at this from a strategic perspective. We need to look at the entire network and we need to look at where we're going in the future. Where is the future of our network? So I'm going to look at all of our things and all of our services because maybe, you know, we've got a lot of users. So we've got things like Active Directory. So we've got directory services. So our users, you know, have a, a common password and we can maintain access to the network easier and all of these other things. Um, we've got, oh, look, I've got keys. Look at that. That's fun. I like all these little icons. All right. So we're trying to figure out what we're going to do with our infrastructure now because we've got we've got some servers. So here's a generic server orange. So we've got a server in each of our offices that's providing connectivity for our users and maybe we've got things like like, you know, file shares and all these other things and our infrastructure is just getting big. So for our company and with Donnie and others that are remote access my proposal is going to be, Jared, I think we should take and consider moving to the cloud. I know that the, the a la carte kind of you know, cost model and the complexity and the, the specific knowledge and skills that we're going to need out of our, our uh, IT infrastructure team are going to be different. And we may end up having to consider different competencies for our staff and how we're going to move into the future. But Jared, I think this is the right option for us because it gives us a very scalable architecture with very, very high availability. So our VPN issue is simplified. Donnie knows how to get into the network easier and everybody else is accessing the network and the tools and the servers and the systems in the same manner. Why is this important? This is important because as long as everything is relatively simplistic or at least consolidated, it's easier to manage the threat surface of this environment the threat surface the threat surface is the the vulnerabilities that your network has just simply by being a network when you have two computers connected to each other you open up your two computers to a measure of vulnerability to the other so by reducing your IT infrastructure footprint by simplifying how everybody accesses it, you start reducing that threat surface and it's easier for you to begin managing standardization, configuration management, and all of the other important things related to uh, infrastructure and security. So we're gonna move to the cloud and we're going to simplify a few other things. Since Donnie's no longer coming into one of our offices, we're going to reduce our infrastructure. So instead of having two firewalls, we're just going to have one good one. Or maybe we have uh, clustered firewalls. And we're going to have two different connections coming in. Because we still want two different connections. Because you don't want to put all of your eggs in one basket. Because while Verizon and Lumen are both very good companies, they still suffer faults and this is just the nature of the beast you know springtime is backhoe season so Verizon might be suffering some fiber cuts and maybe you know Lumen has some different fiber cuts you know it's, it's all about managing your risk 
So we're going to go to the cloud. To the cloud. We're going to go to AWS because I like AWS. Man, these allergies. These allergies are slaying me. Now, would there be so, a cost savings to this? Oh, you had to ask. The CEO had to ask. So what's what's the bottom line here? Is I mean, there a it cost looks like, savings? It looks like we may save money on equipment upgrades because we're not upgrading two pieces of equipment or three pieces of equipment at a time. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's, there could be some of that. There could be some of that. The cost savings with cloud services tend to come when you put more effort into determining like for like. So you remember when we were sitting here and we had two different firewalls, we had two different internet connections, and maybe we're providing services to Donnie, and we wanted redundancy. So let's say we wanted East Coast and West Coast. So now we've got two devices on the East Coast, two devices on the West Coast, multiple service provider connections at both East and West Coast. And we want to make sure that, you know, we've got uh, uh, symmetric performance between our active and our uh, backup kind of connectivities, our primary and secondaries. So we're spending a lot in the infrastructure that we're managing to arrive at something that's still relatively complicated, right? Yes. So is there cost savings? Uh, there could be. There could be. Um, a lot of the cost savings with cloud infrastructures is going to start coming when you identify what you need and when you need it. So we'll, we'll get to that next. Give me one second. So we're going to build our AWS infrastructure. We're going to use this. So in AWS, you have your VPNs and they come into what's called a uh, customer gateway. Um, so all of Donnie's. Oh, man, I just deleted Comcast. <laughs> all right. So we have one more we need. Do, do, do. Oh, here's a VPN gateway. That's what I wanted. We're going to put a VPN gateway in here. Boom. So we've got a VPN gateway and I need that internet gateway. All right. And these are the, the, the true names of things. In AWS, they call it an internet gateway. So our connection to the cloud is going to go through the internet gateway. So all of our facilities are going to come through the internet gateway. These, this makes sense. Let's put that there just to get it out of the way. And then Donnie here, he's going to come in through the VPN gateway. So Donnie comes in through the VPN gateway. I don't like that line. I want my squiggly line. Johnny, you better appreciate this. I'm putting entirely too much time into drawing these lines. All right, so Donnie is coming in through the VPN gateway and the rest of our services are coming in through the internet gateway, but we're actually going to do it different. We're not going to come in through the internet gateway do, 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 because the internet is a filthy, filthy thing. So we're going to do this. We're going to go. Give me a line or give me depth. Here it is. So we're going to have our offices come in through the VPN gateway as well. And we're going to do red because security is red. Do, do, do. Red. Red. And we've got. 
at boom in your red. All right, so we've got our VPNs coming in through the internet into our VPN gateway from each of our two offices. So now when Donnie wants to start accessing corporate resources, we can begin moving those corporate resources up into the cloud. So we moved our corporate servers up into the cloud. So now everybody accesses the same resources all up in the cloud. So in AWS, we've got our infrastructure up there and we've got everything worked out. <clears throat> Did we take and move all of our eggs into a different basket? Do we still have a, a single point of failure? Do we have a new single point of failure? So this is where as the, the engineer, the CTO, I'm looking at all of this and I'm beginning to do all of the war games, right? I'm going to determine where, where are our vulnerabilities, where are our risks to our network? Because Jared, he's my CEO, and he knows that we only make money as long as we're online, right? Absolutely. And maybe, maybe as a CEO, he's got some, some other ideas, some strategies on uh, making more revenue. He's going to see about moving the company in a new direction now that we've got these cloud resources and we've got competencies and we've got good it engineers and finance folks we're going to start doing something new something different to remain relevant and continue the revenue stream so i know it's important that we have to maintain better security and better availability so higher availability these are important things so we're going to start using some other AWS services. And one of those is what's called the availability zones. And the availability zones state that services in one availability zone one and another availability zone two are in different what can be referred to as fault domains. So a fault in AZ1 won't likely impact uh, AZ2. Um, then you have different services like the VPN gateway, which um, don't reside within an availability zone specifically. So we're not going to create multiple different VPN gateways just to avoid that risk. All right. So now we have redundancy in our cloud service. So that's good things, great things. And now everybody's able to access all of things when we've got a high availability of our services. And we're, we're moving ahead and we're doing great things. So, uh, Jared, you're, you're looking at the, the landscape and you're determining what, what kind of things can we monetize? What, what, what can we do with the competencies we've got to in, in either add new products or do the products available in a different way. So I, I look at you and I'd be like, you know, Jared, we could consider getting into more of a higher security type of environment. We've got great finance people. We've got a long institutional knowledge, a deep institutional knowledge in finance. What if we consider getting into more of a high security finance service and we want to provide this level of service to customers and we're going to monetize this this competency we've got what do you think about that jared sounds like an excellent plan to me all right very good so here's my proposal to you since we have since we're going to target because we, we got to figure out who are who our customers, right? We want to target a very specific kind of niche market. And that market is very, very high security, financial auditing and books management and other very sensitive financial um, information and other types of intellectual property. 
we're going to get in the business of high security data analysis and retention. How's that sound? Sounds good to me. I like it. All right. Of course, you know, that comes with all of the risks and all of the other things. So as the CTO, I'm going to begin talking about an architecture. You know, how can we, how can we do high security? So high security gets more complicated. When you start talking about high security, um, you start talking about a, a, a shift in a few different things. So we have a triangle here and we're going to rotate it. So you have your triangle of things. So at the top and the thing that we're really shooting for is what's called confidentiality, right? We want to make sure that the data is safe and secure. Another great metric is availability. So we've got confidentiality and we've got availability. And then over here we're going to take and we're going to put, uh, maybe we'll put cost. There's usually another thing that comes with this and it's usually called integrity. And that usually goes around things like um, data protections, but integrity and confidentiality tend to find themselves uh, intertwined. So the idea of the data is still what you expect it to be is almost intrinsic with a lot of the confidentiality bits. So we're going to exclude that. So cost is always going to start finding itself moving and it's a shifting thing. But confidentiality and availability are two things that find themselves in very uh, polar opposites. So they're very mutually exclusive. Um, if you have more confidentiality, you tend to have less availability. Um, to compensate for that, you have to add cost. Um, what do I mean by that? So if we start going into cryptography, the number one thing that cryptography does is add confidentiality. Once you've encrypted data, people can't read it. To maintain, uh, so sorry, instead of cost, we're going to go, um, we're going to go security. So you add confidentiality that increases your security, but how do you secure the things? So with confidentiality, you have key material. So with the key material, you need to make sure that you're securing that you're protecting it. So the easiest way to ensure the highest level of confidentiality and the highest level of security is to only have one key, right? That makes sense, right? Makes sense to but me. What, what happens if you lose that key? Hmm. So with the key gone, you've lost access to the data. Um, We've arrived at a point where our encryption is strong enough that it it can't be brute forced. We can't break into uh, uh, AES two fifty six encryption. It's it's not it's not feasible right now with the technologies we have. So you've increased your security and you've increased your confidentiality, but with only one key, you've completely tanked your availability, right? So the, yes. the reasonable solution is create a second key. So now your availability is increasing, but your security is beginning to decline. You see where we're at here? Things start moving and mm -hmm. shifting in this triangle here. So as you get higher security and confidentiality, you lose availability. As you begin shifting more this way, your availability increases, but your, your security declines. So you start having to make concessions. If you want to maintain simplicity, then you start finding yourself with a very difficult to manage 
architecture. And it starts getting a lot more complicated. Um, and this is where you have a technical complexity and you have a human complexity. It's, it's easier to tell a machine to do something repetitively than it is to reliably expect a human to do it repetitively. Does that make sense? Sure. Mm -hmm. So when you start talking about how you're going to manage keys and you start talking about how you're going to uh, make sure that keys expire and that, you know, if you've got, if you've got Jimmy here and Jimmy is one of your key holders. So Jimmy's got a key. Oh, oh shoot. I want to name Jimmy, Jimmy. So Jimmy's got a key and over here we've got Sally. Sally's got a key. Right? So Jimmy's got a key and Sally's got a key. Do they have the same key? Can they have a different key? So when you encrypt things, there's only going to be one key. There's only one key for encrypting um, this particular data. Data is encrypted with one key. So technically, there's only one key. However, you can use something called Shamir's Shared Secrets. And you can take and you can create um, two keys that have to be combined to decrypt the one key. Does okay. that make sense? Mm -hmm. So Jimmy and Sally now have one share each. The two shares have to be combined to be able to decrypt the one key used for encrypting the data. So your point of risk now is when Jimmy and Sally, you know, unite, the key is made available. So once the key is available, that is a point of risk. So that's where you have to start talking about how are you going to secure the systems around all of these things. But, you know, we're, we're drifting further and further away. So we're talking about confidentiality, availability, and the security of things. So I lo start looking at this problem, this problem of how are we going to secure as high security as we can while maintaining a relative safety and security of the entire environment, confidentiality, and data loss prevention. So we've got our network. So here is our network. When you have two computers talking to each other, you create a, a potential risk and vulnerabilities. So what are we going to do? So what we do is we're going to build a network within a network. So what we're going to do is we're going to create what's called an air-gapped network. Or a kind of air-gapped network. So it's going to be air-gapped. air gap. So here's our air-gapped network. So this is a network within a network, completely isolated from the rest, but it, it it's only logically contained within because there's a a router. Um, let's, let's skip that. Let's go a firewall. So we've got a firewall that connects this air gap network to the rest of the network. And then there's a firewall that connects that network to the internet. So then you kind of have a sort of DMZ, but this is where your IT engineers are. So you've got your engineer. So here's me and my team. And then we've got Jared and his finance folks, because as the CEO, uh, making money is very near and dear to his heart. So we've got our finance people and they operate within this air gap network and we've got our IT engineers and they work outside because they're just building some software and they're just doing the things. But these things only facilitate the product, which is that financial service that we're providing. So our finance people are within our air gap. We've got the firewall. We've got our engineers out here. and We've got another firewall. So we've created this gapped network. And then as we begin to grow and we you know, begin doing more great things and the CEO is very excited about expanding the company more, we start getting 
um, creep. More and more infrastructure starts getting developed. We still got our cloud out here, right? We still got our cloud services, yet we're building more and more on premise. And my CEO is asking all of these, you know, great questions about why are we adding so much infrastructure and our IT costs are skyrocketing. You know, how can we justify this? It's impacting the bottom line, and and I, I don't have answers for him. But you know, this is this is the business that we chose to get into. So we kind of have to make those choices. So we're going to continue figuring this out. We're going to try to figure out how we're going to keep saving money, right? So we've got our air gap. We've got our engineers. We've got our finance people. We're making great money. We're doing great things. So now, now as we're scoping, we're, we're increasing all of our infrastructure and our scope is creeping. Uh, my CEO is going to come to me and he's going to say the IT you know, costs are skyrocketing. So what's, what's the... What's the next thing, Jared? What, what are you going to tell me that we need to consider? Um, maybe some sort of... Um, automation? Or... Um... All right, auto automation. Let's talk about auto automation. So... So Jared, he's he's cruising around the internet and he sees some great buzzwords. He's like, automation, automate the things, DevOps, you know, all these great things, machine learning. So he, he came to me and said, hey, what, what, what can we do? Can we use automation to reduce our IT budget? So automation. Automation is a great tool for reducing the human capital, the human resources. If we want to do more with fewer people, or we want to, if we want to do the same thing with fewer people or do more with the same people, automation is a good option. If we want to standardize the way that we do things so that we can do the same thing repetitively the same way every time, automation is a good option. However, automation doesn't tend to reduce the number, the amount of equipment. It doesn't uh, reduce the competencies necessary for your IT engineers. So you'll tend to have to flip a few more bucks at your IT engineers, your IT infrastructure teams, um, so that you can either do more with what you have or do the same with less. So it is it is a way to reduce the budget. It's a good option. So automation is is an option. So automation. Automation. Do more with less or more with the same. If that makes sense. Makes sense to me. So automation is a good option, sir. You know, but I really think we... I really don't think it's going to get us the bang for the buck. So the next thing typically goes toward consolidation. How can we take all of these expensive things and instead of having two, three, four, five of the same thing, can we just have one? That makes sense, right? It does. The CEO is just wondering when we consolidate do we lose redundancy? Ah, that's a good question. So that kind of goes back to that same thing that we were talking about over here, right? So we've got availability. So as we consolidate and we start reducing that redundancy, the availability starts getting compromised. It also begins impacting our security. So as we begin consolidating, especially in this environment, how do we consolidate these two storage silos? Because we've got one that's high security in this environment, and we've got one that's less security outside in this environment. How can how can we solve that problem? So if we were to expose this storage to our finance people, um, that would reduce some of the storage maybe. But we don't want to expose this storage to these people. So we can't take this storage and move it out here and consolidate out here. And if we consolidate this into here, then that means there's more traffic crossing this firewall, which increases that threat, increases the risk of compromise. So what do we do? How do we solve this problem? 
So this begins to enter a very complex issue and the balance between complexity and security and confidentiality and availability. Everybody wants to keep things simple. I personally appreciate simplicity, but only as long as it's not compromising the engineering and the options, the flexibility and, or compromising, you know, the satisfaction of the requirements. So Jared wants me to consider consolidating. So I start looking at this and I'm like, you know, what, what can we do? How can we have a high security environment and consolidate things? How can we solve this problem? So there are options, but there's no easy off the shelf options. This is a very complex problem. So let's, we're going to make a little bit more real estate here. Our finance people take up too much space. Just don't tell them that. Everybody is, is a unique flower. So, how do we solve this problem? So, there are lots of different ways to do this. But here's what it starts boiling down to. you create another new air gap. I know the complexity is adding up. I didn't, uh, I never led you to believe this was going to be a simple solution. <laughs> Excuse me. So we're going to send backward. We're gonna go backward again. Okay, this is too much. There we go. All right, so here's our target. We want to have one storage to rule them all. So let's begin figuring out what that means. Oh, it's talking. All right, so we've got one storage to rule them all. One thing that we're definitely going to need is a firewall, right? We want to make sure that IT engineer is, you know, going through all the good security, all the right things. So that's important. That's important to us to make sure that that's safe. We want to make sure that this special storage network, not to be confused with the storage area network, so we're just going to call this storage. So this storage network needs to be safe and secure. Uh, so we're going to make sure that it has a firewall. And that, that's important. Security is important. And we've got the firewall for our internet. We want to make sure that there's... A little bit more that a bad actor, a malicious actor, is going to have to go through to achieve success in this effort. Uh, we need to make the level of effort greater. So we've got a network and we've got a storage. We need to figure out how to get this storage in here while keeping it safe and secure. And we're going to do that by looking at a few options. So this this problem has been considered to a degree by other other organizations other other groups other peoples and we're going to look at what's called the um, uh, the CSFC it is a uh, NSA specification for how the US government handles certain things um, all of this is published and made available all of these wonderful bits are here so what we're looking for is the data at rest the dar compatibility package the data at rest compatibility package here it is data at rest capability all right so the data at rest capability package according to the nsa states that 
Um, data that is stored at rest is safe and secure if it is uh, fully encrypted at rest. So if you've got your data and it's encrypted in here, and where's my key? Where'd that key go? I'm gonna throw a key on here. Boom. Oh, we've got colored keys. Blue. All right. So we've got a blue key and we've got our storage. So all of our drives in this storage appliance are all encrypted. So all of the data is encrypted. Why is this important? This is important because when it comes time to get rid of your storage appliance, and you've got your team, your infrastructure team, that's getting rid of your storage appliance, and they've got, you know, 4,000 hard drives. They need to run all of those through, you know, the proper disposal solution. So maybe they've got a drive shredder, or maybe they're 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 all mechanical, uh, mag, mag, uh, magnetic drives. So they're going to run them all through the degausser. Um, and somebody was doing this late at night and they you know started zoning out and didn't degauss all of the drives so there were drives that went to uh, disposal they got recycled and they were still uh, uh, plain text unencrypted so there's data on those drives that people can now extract so all of that great secret financial information that we've been protecting all of those great uh, sensitive bits that we were protecting for all of our clients are now exposed and they're losing face and we're getting sued and nobody's happy nobody's had a good day today the data at rest the encrypted drives make sure that all of our data is safe even when that guy fell asleep that's a good thing right right boss it's absolutely a good thing I and mean, it's totally it's totally believable right this, this kind of stuff can happen right the, the human Easily. element is there um, so we take and we've got encrypted hard drives so this is a hardware encryption option because the the hard drive itself has an encryption module on it all right so we've we've protected that so that's good but what happens when you know something nasty is out here and let's say here it is here we go this is it right here so we've got malicious something or other and it's going to begin trying to do a thing so it's going to try to access the storage the data was only encrypted on the drive so it's still plain text when read through the system so that's that's not good right you can you can see the data so this virus is able to extract that and this is bad news, especially when this storage gets consolidated. So now finance here is storing all of their files up into this storage. So now so now all of our files are stored up into this storage and they're all plain text when the system is operating. When you pull out the drive, they're safe and secure. But while the system is operating, all of the data is visible. So this this starts getting into the bigger question of how do you secure the data where it's all being commingled like this in this environment. So what you can do is you can add more encryption. There's there's no limit to the amount of encryption you can have. It's just you know it starts. Uh, we go back to this again as you increase the confidentiality more. Um, the security starts changing, the availability starts changing, the cost might change. You know, performance is going to start decreasing, but sometimes that's an acceptable compromise. You have to make that choice. So we start looking at things like how do you secure the data? And if we look at NSA's capability package, one of the things that they suggest is like double wrapping your data, encrypting it with two different types of technologies or two different solutions. Um, two different options so we've got hardware that's encrypting the drives maybe we're gonna add software now that's a that's a good option right software is pretty easily attainable so we need to figure out how we're going to add a software solution and make this a scalable option something that we can keep growing we'll need a firewall because we want to make sure that this is safe and secure uh, maybe we'll, we'll skip this we don't need this so we've got our air gap network and we've got our storage network and they're looking pretty similar they're both protected. 
So this is what we would call a security perimeter. So right here is our security perimeter. When you start talking about security perimeters, you want to make sure that everything's secure within that perimeter, right? That makes sense, right? If you've got your house and it's got four walls and a door, um, you should consider everything within those four walls and a door secure, right? Yes. And then when you step outside, you would consider yourself vulnerable, right? 100%. Least, we'll say vulnerable to the elements. You know, we, we live in the, the tundra, and if we step outside into this, this you know, great, you know, cold world, uh, we need to make sure that we've protected ourselves. And we're going to protect ourselves within our, you know, safety bubble, within our four walls and a door, before we exit out into this, you know, frigid world around us. So we're going to throw our jacket and our snow pants and our, our great big snow boots and our gloves and hats and all that wonderful stuff. We're going to do it all inside while we're still safe and secure. And I'm trying to find something, but I cannot find it. All right, we'll just use generic server objects. Active Directory. Oh, look at that. These aren't what I'm looking for. All right. So what we need to do in this environment is we need to encrypt our data before it leaves our perimeter. So we're going to take and we're going to put some services in here and we're going to add some encryption and we're going to add some keys so we've got we've got some keys so we're going to say over the this is the orange key so here's our orange key and we're going to use pki so this is going to be our root ca where's our root where's our text boom all right so we've got our root ca We'll probably try to wrap this up and we'll continue this um, in the next video. We're getting into the fun stuff now. This is the this is the world domination bit. This is where we start making all of our money. And as a CAO, I, I can I can just hear his mouth watering. So here is our root CA. So we're going to start using certificates and we're going to start signing all of our stuff and we're going to start encrypting everything and we're going to start doing all of this. So when finance needs to write a file, can we find a file? Do we have a file? File. Document. It'll work. So we've got our document. So finance guy writes a document. Finance person writes a document. So he's going to send it to the file server. So here's our file server. And it's going to encrypt it. And then it's going to send it over to our storage environment. So here we've got storage. So file is going to be written over to... So a finance person is going to write the document. The document is going to go to the storage system. So this is the storage system within the perimeter. And then it's going to be encrypted. With the orange key. So this is the key from within our AirGap Finance Network, and that's going to be sent over to this server. Which is going to recognize the orange key, and it's going to say good things. I know who you are, and I know what you're trying to, uh, to write. And then it's going to take and write it over to the storage. And then it's going to be encrypted now. It's it's uh, it's a document file. Oh. 
It's a document that is now double encrypted. The important thing is that the certificates, the keys that used that were used to encrypt the document remain within this air gap. So if the virus does access this network, it can only draw out encrypted files. That also means that IT engineer can write files into the environment as well. Maybe he doesn't need to write them encrypted because he's not doing anything that's super, super spooky or really interesting and nobody really wants the, thing, the things that he's doing. So he's able to write his documents in here. And then those get stored in the environment as well. So now we've got some encrypted files, we've got some unencrypted files, and all the files are stored in a single solution. <clears throat> the only thing that's allowed to talk to this server is this server for retrieving these files. Does that make sense? Did I lose, did I lose you, boss? No, oh, I've got you. So we leverage what's what would be called a server and client certificates between these two. So this server, when talking to this server, is going to use a client certificate. He's going to use a certificate, a server one. He's going to reach in and speak to this server. This server sees his certificate, recognizes who he is, and says, you only have access to retrieve files that were encrypted with a certificate from your root CA. Okay. Okay. He doesn't really care too much about what files you're accessing, and he doesn't really care too much about how they were encrypted because he doesn't see that. He can't decrypt the files. When you encrypt the file and you sign it, when you sign the file, you are taking a hash of the file and you're writing that into the file and stating this file with, that is hashed like this, that hash encrypted with this certificate can be decrypted with this key and this certificate is written in plain text into the file. So that somebody can read the certificate, read the public key that can be used to decrypt the hash and recognize that this file was matches this hash and is then considered high integrity so it has not changed and you have a measure of ownership so this file being signed by this server from this key from the root authority uh, in this environment this server now knows that the file originated here and that is where it shall go. So it was came from here and only there can retrieve it. Okay. This starts getting into more of the bigger bits about how you would manage the key infrastructure. But what we've built is the the bare bones of a consolidated high security storage solution where you can have multiple different very sensitive data elements all stored on a single storage platform. It's complex and it's a lot more than your typical enterprise would have, but we're talking about a atypical enterprise already. Somebody who's already in a position, we are in a position of uh, very high security, but we wanna maintain a high profitability so this is a good option to your question about redundancy what you'll typically do in a in an enterprise especially if you're distributed so you've got multiple different storage silos they're typically going to be smaller size and probably of a lower class so they won't have as many of those bigger enterprise features once you start talking about consolidation however you your price point starts to change so you can get the same amount of storage for a lower cost or the same amount of storage with more features. Mm. Make sense? Mm -hmm. 
So we can now start changing that uh, conversation about availability. And these things, you know, are obviously very appealing, especially once you start talking about for-profit organizations where you want to make maintain the highest profitability and lowest margins while still being able to protect security. So if we look at this environment, boss, this is a good option. And I will have to present the risks. This solution is not an off-the-shelf solution, which means we're going to have to maintain and retain specific competencies and institutional knowledges. People who know how this is built, understand it, and can operate it. So what, what do you think about that? Um, it's good in theory. Um, but I will also say that most people in tech jobs don't stick around for much beyond seven to 10 years in a, in a position. So True. are we pigeonholing ourselves into something that we won't be able to maintain past seven years? And now we're going to be rebuilding. That's a good question. That's a good question. That's a solid question. Seven years. So a lot of IT has a, a life expectancy. It's called life cycle development. Um, everything has a life cycle things live and they die and they evolve so this solution is a good solution and it may not be the last solution but it may be a good enough solution for now so this is where you begin to really have that long conversation between your business elements and your tech elements on what this means what what do you get out of this what does it cost how does it go into the future um, how do we stay uh, ahead what happens when we fall behind so those are great questions and i want to have those questions in our next video this video covered the evolution of an office and an enterprise we went from something small and a few people in one office and then we grew we had to increase our security posture we had to add remote users we talked about redundancy these are all bigger network architectures we're talking about big things we talked about single mode versus multi-mode fiber we talked about connectivity options we talked about redundancy including cellular we started opening up bigger infrastructures and architectures to include cloud resources we moved our servers up into the cloud to increase availability increase features and functionality all of these are great things but the risk starts changing we started talking about a bigger business model something a more niche model we're going to start going after the big sharks in the financial fields and maintaining data security and integrity the architecture that we're talking about go ahead and i do think that you'll get to a certain point right where you will probably i think even in a lot of um, businesses like this you would start discussing um, separation of duties to prevent that insider threat or that kingdom uh, from yes. coming down right yes so we start getting back into this you know conversation right confidentiality versus availability versus security so we start talking about all of those functions so this is where the real, the real nitty gritty details of this consolidated storage architecture come into play. When we start talking about, well, how do you and war game all of these things. In our next video, we're going to go into more of those details. It's going to be a video more specific on this consolidated uh, high security storage option. What are we going to do to protect the data? make sure that it remains available and what do all of these options mean for cost long-term supportability and uh, availability of of hardware 
Um, all of this resides somewhere, so it still has to have a landing zone. What does that mean? Um, how do we move the data from you know, storage system A to B? How do we maintain these architectures going forward? What, what, are the, what do these software solutions look like? So I look forward to uh, having you join us in our future video, and I hope you enjoyed this. And Consolidated Storage is next, and have a good evening. Thanks.